Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Jason Freeman, and I'm very excited to be here to introduce tonight's guest, David Zucker. David Zucker, along with Jim Abrams and Jerry Zucker, are the auteurs of the cultishly adored Kentucky Fried movie and Top Secret. Each of these giants of comedy have branched out into other beloved films and film series. Tonight's author himself went on to direct a plethora of other films, including my beloved Naked Gun franchise, Basketball, Scary Movie 3 and 4, and many others, as well as writing and producing Scary Movie 5. He is also the author of the memoir, Before the Invention of Smiling, uh, an unconventional telling of his family history. He, of course, joins us tonight with Surely You Can't Be Serious, The True Story of Airplane. It's a behind-the-scenes making of oral history of the 1980 titular comedy classic as told by its equally legendary writers and directors, again, Zucker, the Zuckers and uh, Jim Abrams. Uh, featuring anecdotes by the film's stars, it also delves into the making of fan-favorite scenes and the organic red pre-internet evolution toward its place in the pop culture pantheon. So as both a lover of books and a lover of this film, I wonder what to make of it. And I suppose I can make a hat or a brooch <laughs> or a pterodactyl. I was lying to you before. I, will, I, I have a joke or two. Tonight's author will be in conversation with James Murray. You may also know him as Murr, one of the hosts of the long-running and popular True TV program, uh, True TV improv program, Impractical Jokers. Also the co-author of the Awakened and Area 51 intern series of sci-fi novels, he has toured solo as a stand-up comedian, starred in TBS's The Misery Index, and appeared in numerous other television shows and films. Speaking of his comedy tour, you can catch him this Thursday, the 26th, at the Starland Ballroom in nearby Sayersville, New Jersey. And now to David and Murr, I think I speak for everyone in Philadelphia when I say, I just want to tell you both, good luck. We're all counting on you. Please welcome tonight's guests. Hi, everybody. Welcome. They, they <laughs> Hi, like Dave. It this way. Oh, yeah, I, I'm a, I hold. Can I just, oh, you hold it? Yeah, yo, you do what you want. How yeah, about, nah, can they even hear They're me? freaking out. I was supposed to sit in that chair. They have the spotlights aimed toward my bald head. <laughs> That's how you should be seen. Yeah. Uh, how about a hand for David Zucker, everybody? <laughs> Holy cow. And, I, I was and, uh, and, and James Murray. Oh, I mean, I, it's thank an you. honor for was, me. Not really, but yeah. I was uh, honored when David asked me to be part of tonight. Uh, he he had first called uh, Sal, but he was on his solo tour, and and, and then he yeah. called Joe, but Joe was uh, with his dogs, yeah. and Q was with his cats. But I was the fourth call he made, and I said yes. That's I mean, so. they should you should be happy with that. that yeah. You're, you're, Congratulations, you're my friend. 10. I have read thank the book you. entirely. Has anyone read the book yet? Not yet. Well, they're in for a here? treat. Yes. Go home and read the book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the book is amazing. Uh, it's incredible. It's very. It, it's incredible insights into airplane, how it was made. Uh, I found it as insightful as to your process of growing up, how you guys developed your comedy uh, from all the way from Wisconsin to L.A., then ultimate success with airplane and your career since. Uh, you know, uh, we've said we on Impractical Jokers, we've made so many references to Airplane, Naked Gun, all of the Zucker Brothers movies over the years. And one of the, the proudest moments of my life was when you came on Impractical Jokers and told me I wasn't funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I remember that now, yes. Yeah. But it's, yeah. you know, your, your comedic <laughs> idol telling you you're not funny is gold. It's but, but I was also on the one where we, uh, it was the Joker's dinner. You were on dinner I party like as a that guest. One too, right? That's yeah. right. Okay. And again, ripped into me. And I, yeah. I don't know why. Yeah. yeah. I, well, I, I, well, I don't like you that much. You but, know, yeah. <laughs> I can sense but it. I'm glad to have you here. Well, thank you. you. I appreciate yeah. it. If it helps sell the book, this is this is great. <laughs> Uh, uh, so you know, but, but actually, wait a minute. I have to say, I'm uh, in all seriosity. I'm a huge admirer of the Joker's. And I think they're the funniest thing out there. And I, I think they're about the only thing that really makes me laugh. Okay, uh, so I, I thought I'd start by telling a quick story of how uh, yeah. the Zucker Brothers and us met. We've idolized you for decades, decades. Literally, uh, our formative comedy growing up, for sure. 
uh, even more so than Mel Brooks or other uh, greats out there, uh, was our style of comedy was definitely airplane style of comedy. And uh, and years ago, we were at the Wild West Comedy Festival, the guys and I in Nashville. In Nashville, yeah. that's right. And I saw we were at breakfast in the morning, and I, in the morning, and I saw Zucker and his brother sitting across from us, and I said, "Holy shit! Do you know who that who that is? That's the Zucker brothers." <laughs> I lost my mind. I told the guys. We went over. They blew us off. They, <laughs> they, they asked us to bust their table, which is yeah. strange. Well, we didn't know who you were. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you didn't know the show yet. I didn't know the show. I think I had walked in one time to the den, and Charles was watching it. And yeah. I remember that from years, but I didn't pay much attention. I was only there for three minutes, and I left. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so his son was a fan of the show and had seen the show before, so we uh, asked if we could send you some DVDs of the, the show, and we did, and not expecting a response. Well, and I, 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 wait, I, didn't, I didn't watch it for a month. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then I finally watched it, and do you want me to tell the story? Sure, I mean, it was, I was laughing so hard, I could only watch 20 minutes of it because I was literally choking. Which is great, because yeah, the episodes yeah. are only 22 minutes long, by the way. <laughs> Somehow I lasted for 20 minutes, though. I, I couldn't see the, the rest of the, the two minutes. So anyways, like a month or two after we sent him the DVDs, yeah. uh, an email comes in from David Zucker uh, to our emails. It w I remember it distinctly. It was Saturday night. It was like a midnight. The email <laughs> comes in from him telling us that he couldn't watch the show for more than like 20 minutes at a time because he had tears of laughter streaming down my fa his face. And the guys and I immediately got on a group conference call screaming like children at how excited we were. And to this day, in my house... Is that email framed, autographed by you? Isn't that <laughs> wild? Yeah. yeah. And I'll autograph a book, too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But anyways, tonight is about Airplane and yeah. its legacy and how important of a movie it was in history and culture, uh, in comedy, of course, as you affected so many comedians throughout the years. I thought it'd be great to start with you just telling us about uh, what it was like growing up in Wisconsin, being the funniest guys there. Well, uh, we weren't the funniest guys there. <laughs> <laughs> no, really we, that weren't. was obvious. Yeah, but yeah, but, yeah. and and we tell we say that in the book. I mean, there were there were probably uh, five or six guys in our high school who we thought were funnier than we were, but they were able to find jobs after <laughs> after school, and we just you know started this theater and got into comedy. Um, but it would, there was something in the water, I suppose. Uh, there was one story we tell in the book about uh, uh, we had this, uh, there's this room at the top of the third floor of the high school, which is called the Copper Dome. It was a glass ceiling, and the, it was, uh, the acoustics were very bad. So what the school did, they put a huge American flag uh, across the ceiling, and it really solved the acoustic problem. And so Jim Abrams had a class there and uh, one and uh, they, and one day they had a substitute teacher, and the substitute teacher says, "Well, how how do you usually start the day?" And Jim's friend Pete Prusing said, "Well, we always say pledge allegiance to the flag." And so he lays down on his back <laughs> and looks up, and and the whole class did the same, and the teacher did the same too, and they they said the pledge of allegiance. So this was went on was what went on at Shorewood High School. <laughs> And t tell us about college. What was the, your first experience making a movie like in college? Well, uh, I think when, when I was a junior, I took this course uh, called Introduction to Radio, Television, Film, uh, taught by a professor named Chuck Sherman. And I thought, oh my God, this is great. I could actually take a class in what I want to do. And so we, we, uh, one of the assignments was to do a short film. So I did a 10 minute short film. And, it, it was uh, it was a, a comedy film, of course. So I'm sure your other students in the class did did all sorts of serious art. They, yeah, it was films. total like light reflected through under tables and yeah. you know very esoteric artsy stuff. And my movie was about my brother Jerry running around the campus, uh, being chased by a, a guy with his pants down, and he was trying to find a place to pee. And finally, he 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 was. I guess it's funny, but uh, he gets up on the top of Lincoln statue and, and pees. But that was that was it, the six seven minute film. So I show it in my study section for about 20, 20 students, and as I said, they all did very you know very serious things. And then my movie comes on, and everybody laughed, maybe despite themselves. But and and so the TA said, well. You, 
you just have to enter that in a film festival. So a week later, he says, you know, he showed the, uh, the, the movie to the professor, and he said, the, the pr Professor Sherman wants to show it in the big lecture class, you know, 600 students. So Jerry and I went there and actually showed it in front. It's like, it was like a movie theater. It was our first experience uh, showing a movie, and it just, it was, it was laughs. A lot of laughs. It was great. I think we were hooked after that. About that's it. That could be addicted movie. to that's, it. We thought, hey, we could do movies. Yeah. All right. And then, but your first move wasn't into movies. You started, of course, the Kentucky Fried Theater, first in Wisconsin, then ultimately in L.A. Yeah, you can't go right to Hollywood and apply for a job as a movie director. <laughs> so, so what we did, we started a little theater called Kentucky Fried Theater, and uh, we had 70 seats in the back of a bookstore, and it was very popular. And so we could only charge a dollar admission, so we decided, well, we have to move uh, to either New York or L.A. And by that time, uh, the uh, Tonight Show had moved to California, to L.A., so we decided we'd try to do that so we can get on the Tonight Show, and it would probably be more comfortable to starve in the warm weather of L.A. Uh, <laughs> as opposed to New York. What was the experience like uh, running your own theater for so many years? Well, it, you know, it got to be a place to experiment with our humor, and so we did this theater uh, in Madison and, uh, for a year and then five years in L.A., uh, and, and for, it was twice as big of, of an audience, and we got to experiment with, with humor, see what worked you know, with a live audience every night, and, uh, and, and that was like invaluable to us. Were you changing the show on a daily basis based on audience reactions? No, we were much too lazy to, <laughs> to ever do that. We, we did one show, and uh, we did some improvisations, but then the guy who was with us who did um, improvisations quit, and then we didn't do any improvisations. And, uh, but, but it was... Uh, we, would, we would sometimes ad lib, but what we would do then is, uh, and the ad libs got big laughs, and so we would keep the ad lib line in the show, but as an ad lib, and we'd all pretend that it was the first time we heard it, and we'd all laugh, and we were so full of shit. It was like, <laughs> it was unbelievable, yeah. In, in L.A., uh, the theater exploded. It did very, very well for a number of years. It did, yeah. It was, it was we were packed. Well, the, we, we really... Um, we had no ad budget. We just came from Wisconsin, not, not really any money. And so we called our first show My Nose, just so our weekly uh, LA Times listing would say, My Nose runs continuously. <laughs> so it was, it was like, we did better jokes later. But, uh, uh, and, and then, and then we, what we did, we rented a big billboard uh, out, right outside the theater in the vacant lot, and we said, this is it, Kentucky Fried Theater. We, we rented it for a month, and then we organized a protest against a neighborhood protest. 100 people showed up, and we called the media, LA Times, TV stations, and they were told that a big corporation planned to tear down the billboard and plant a tree in its place. And we were <laughs> carrying placards saying, save the sign. And, and, and so, and we were packed after that. It was like, That's yeah, brilliant. Yeah, it was. My, my favorite story you've ever told is, uh, you know, I'm sure you're wondering what did uh, they do with the airplane money when they made all that money, right? And one of the things you did was you bought a racehorse. Oh, that we bought right? a racehorse, yeah. But the racehorse was solely for uh, a joke. Well, it was solely for a joke. And we had to buy three racehorses because we had to name the horse. So you have to put a mare in foal, and it takes three years. And so, and we, we so we uh, we named the horse all pink, so, and the, we told the jockey, "Don't don't bother trying to win the race. Just run the horse on the rail." So we get the call from the track announcer, and it's all pink on the inside, and so, <laughs> and, and and that, and and so, Can you believe it? what do you know? The, the, the coming up, it's all pink on the inside. Yeah. <laughs> So the, the first horse didn't get the call. So we had to put another mare in full, another three years, and another $30,000 or something. You know? and, 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 and that was called uh, Old Pink. And the, fine, the third one was AWL, All Pink. That got the call. That finally. got the call, yeah. All Pink on the inside? Yeah. That's a $100,000 joke yeah. right there. I love that. 
Yeah. Uh, which is uh, actually the, your commitment to the joke is one of the things we admire most about you. I mean, there's so many great stories <laughs> of how committed you get to the joke. <laughs> my my favorite is uh, what Tommy Metapupu. <laughs> what is his name? The uh, from your high school reunion. Oh days. yeah, uh, I, Tommy. Is it? This was no. It was we had uh, mostly all, it was all white high school, uh, but it, the only black person was the exchange student uh, Mujabi Mapaka, and. Uh, and so we, uh, and so, uh, and everybody loved him. And of course, we we all called him Blowjobby. And he, but he 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 loved, <laughs> he he thought it was funny. Anyways, uh, so uh, forty years pass, and then at our reunion, uh, my friend Lewis Friedman and I uh, hired an actor from Milwaukee to come to the reunion in a African dashiki and claim that he was Mujabi. And so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the joke goes further. So they hired this black actor to come into their 40-year high school reunion pretending he was the Kenyan student, transfer student from 40 years earlier. Yeah, and, but we, and, and we gave him, him and we read, yeah, we dressed him in the dashiki, and, which he never, the real Mujabi never wore. And he goes, and we, we gave him a speech to read. Mm -hmm. And he said, in my country, there is no homosexuality. <laughs> I, had to, I had to learn what I had to, uh, oh yeah, I would be put to death for things that I did with some of you in high school. <laughs> and you know, and, and just stuff like that. And, and the guy, the actor was great. And then everybody wanted to have their picture taken with him. Sure. And then they sent it to the guy who was his AFS family, you know, guy. And the guy said, that's not, not Mujabi. <laughs> and, you know, and so then they, they called the FBI. They thought this was a, an African prince, and they were going to, yeah. And then, uh, and then, and then we, then we, uh, yeah. The, the joke goes further. Yeah, we Zucker kept, did not this, stop this, there. Yeah. Then, then we, we had, we wrote an email on behalf of Mujabi to the the guy in the class who was the most broke guy in the class, asking for five thousand dollars to return to uh, Uganda, <laughs> and. And and so then uh, and, and then and the, the whole class you know, the emails were just going you know all over the place and then then we had uh, we 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 made a fake news story that this guy named uh, whoever you know Arlen Smith was arrested in Joliet Illinois for impersonating uh, a, a person in, in the class and meaning to uh, uh, you know debunk them and or defraud them out of money and uh, and that and that went and so and he said we said in the article he went over uh, he went under many uh, pseudonyms like uh, Mujabi Mapaka, Arando Makaba, Musaba Lababa and, and Lars Jorgensen <laughs> so and, and then so and and, uh, and and so and and we said in the article uh, I'm trying to remember all this, but we said in the article he would often uh, show up at uh, at, at re reunions um, and, and uh, uh, pick out a one of the elderly people and and romance them and have sex with them and, and debunk them out of. Or, and it actually happened at one uh, reunion, and so one 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 of my classmates said, "We are not elderly." Yeah, that was that was. <laughs> That was her reaction. <laughs> anyway, so we, we kept doing it. And so to this day, nobody found out. We never said anything. It's amazing, right? Yeah. So he printed a fake news article, got sent around the email list of this <laughs> black scam artist is going around pretending he's transfer students from people's high school reunions, yeah. seducing elderly white women and stealing them from out of $5,000. But I want to cast a guy in a movie. Yeah. And then I'll put him, you know, uh, by uh, su such and such played by Mujabi Mapaka. And then, so I can, if I'm on talk shows, I can actually tell this, the whole I story. I the story. Yeah. I don't want to out you because the but, story's too good. All yeah. these poor f classmates of yours think it's, think it's yeah, real. Yeah, but I had a great time on one of the cruises. I, I told the whole story and put up the, the news article on the, yeah. on the screen and everything. It was fun. So uh, back to, so you moved oh, to yeah, L.A. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah, the back yeah, of the book. Yes. Uh, uh, the move to L.A. Uh, and then starting the Kentucky Fried Theater from scratch, rebuilt, literally rebuilding the theater, you had so many choices. You could have gone to New York. You could have gone to L.A. And God knows uh, how different life would have been had you moved to New York or not gone to L.A. to start right. the Kentucky Fire uh, Theater. I think we really didn't know it at the time. We thought we were a performing group. And we didn't know, we really didn't 
think in our wildest dreams that we would you know, be movie directors or do movies uh, until well, we actually were on The Tonight Show, and that was our dream. And, but we were kind of underwhelming <laughs> on, the, on The Tonight Show. And so, uh, and then we, were, we did a couple of other uh, television appearance, appearances, national uh, TV appearances. And I always say uh, we made a joint decision with the networks not to do any more TV. <laughs> so, uh, but, th but then we, uh, we stopped, we uh, cast ourselves out of the show. We, we did another show and, and cast other actors so that we could concentrate on writing a movie. One of the fascinating things I found in the book was uh, the story that you would pitch, you know, Kentucky Fried Theater was basically a sketch variety show, right. musical components to it, which sounds an awful lot like Saturday Night Live, right? This is before Saturday Night Live. And you actually pitched a version of that, and the yeah. studios didn't want it. No, we pitched it to our agent. Uh -huh. We said, we, th uh, we think a national show with music and comedy sketches and blah, blah, blah would work. And she said, no, that, would, that wouldn't work. But it was our fault for listening to this agent. Sure. And then yeah. a few months later, uh, a very young Lorne Michaels yeah. saw your show. Yeah, and evidently LA. we found out later, we, I read this in their book about Saturday Night Live, that he pitched Saturday Night, Night Live to the network as... Uh, a show based on Kentucky Fried Theater. Isn't that so, wild? Yeah. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. I read so, it in the book, and my mind was blown that you inspired Saturday Night Live. Uh, evidently. But, but, you know, we could not have done it, and, uh, you know, Lauren uh, is a brilliant producer, and he's the guy that should have done that show. And yeah. we, we really wanted to do movies. And yeah. so we, were, we wanted to do a movie, but we didn't have an idea for a movie. Until you saw Zero Hour. Uh, until we, yeah, we were we would uh, videotape overnight uh, the you know late night television, hoping to get commercials to spoof in our show. And so one morning we cleared off the machine and we started getting involved not in the commercials but in the uh, in the movie, the late night movie that was playing, which was this black and white movie called Zero Hour, had the exact same plot. Exact yeah, same uh, plot. Uh, and, oh, some uh, of the same dialogue. What uh, another? Oh yeah, there's one. There's a line in Zero Hour. It's same thing. The guy uh, with PS, PTSD flies up in the plane and is uh, chasing his girlfriend and uh, food poisoning, and he has to fly down the plane. Same thing. So there's a line in Zero Hour that says, "Stewardess, uh, we have to find somebody back there." who uh, not only can fly this plane, but who didn't have fish for dinner. It's <laughs> <That's laughs> great. And, yeah. And, and that was, uh, yeah, that was, in, yeah, that uh, was actually in the... Another fascinating realization from reading the book was uh, I, it was borderline uh, just stealing direct lines from the movie. Oh, which, it was which everything was really stolen. skirts, yeah. uh, really pushes the limits of parody law when you're using exact right, dialogue. Right, and we, we showed the script to John Landis, who had, we had met. And he said, guys, this isn't parody, this is plagiarism. <laughs> and... And that was, uh, and, and so we actually went and bought the rights. Which is wild. They bought the rights to zero yeah. hour. Which was cheap. They, they, didn't, they didn't see any value in it. Sure, it had yeah. been many years earlier. It was, a, oh, zero it was 1957. Yeah. yeah. So they bought the rights to the movie so there'd be no legal issues with directly parroting it. Yeah, but zero hour had a lot of these uh, setup lines that we use. Like uh, the, the guy who plays the air con air controller in zero hour says looks like I picked the wrong week to quit smoking <laughs> and that's right in zero hour. so we added uh, quit drinking amphetamines and finally uh, sniffing, sniffing glue, glue. <laughs> yeah and and the pilot there's a little boy who comes up to the cockpit and the pilot in zero hour g gives a boy a little plane and says and, and says, have you ever been up on a plane before? <laughs> and, and that, but that's all he said. We added all the other yeah. stuff. Yeah. You ever seen a grown man, man naked? Right, yeah. <laughs> and that, yeah. that led to, uh, yeah. Which is such yeah. an edgy line. Yeah. When you think, I cannot believe you got Peter Graves to say that. Well, of all people. Uh, Peter Graves, when we first gave him the script, uh, uh, he reported later that he just threw the script across the room and said, this is the worst piece of trash <laughs> I've ever read. And, uh, but we, uh, our, our executive producer, Howard Koch, uh, knew Peter, and so he had him into, to meet, and I think he was surprised that he expected that we were these drugged out weirdos to have written a line like that. But, you know, we kind of, 
impressed them as this these just Midwestern guys. That was interesting in the book too, seeing how many uh, hidden secret allies you had along the way, oh, such yeah. as Howard Koch. Very lucky. Yeah, well, we were lucky just to get to Paramount. I, every studio had turned it down. Uh, there was one guy, Michael Eisner, who was the head of Paramount, who heard about the script and and just immediately called his second in command or the vice president there and said, uh, he hadn't even read it. And he said, have those guys in my office on Monday. So, And he says in the book, he's interviewed, and he said, you know, he doesn't believe in waiting on anything. It's just act on it right away. He's one of those angel, secret angels that yeah. uh, un, unknown, you know, unknown to anyone else basically green lights your entire career. Right, and we, yeah, it was, uh, and I, I went to his office, made sure I went to his office uh, in Century City in L.A. and personally gave him the book signed by the three of us. And uh, I just wanted to thank him because I never thought we showed enough gratitude because we just didn't know at that time how much uh, Michael Eisner did for us. Uh, you're, when you were selling the movie, uh, the whole process of making movies fascinating in the book, too. It took years, yes, uh, yeah. years to get the movie off the ground. Uh, you had the script for upwards of five years five before years, right. it was finally greenlit, right? Yeah. Well, and yeah. Even when it was at approach, you were in rewrites with the studio with Paramount, uh, but even then you were holding off on selling selling them in the movie because they wouldn't let you be d directors of the movie. Right. Nobody wanted to let us direct because not only were we first time directors, but there were three of us, and that that had never been done. So finally, Paramount relented, and they said uh, two pro two provisos. Howard Koch would be our executive producer. They'd have, he was a past president of the studio and president of the Motion Picture Academy. So this guy was high up there. And the other uh, clause was that they could fire us after two weeks. Which is crazy. And, and, and you know, we were fine with being fired after two weeks. We didn't know who Howard Koch was, but he turned out to be you know, our man at Paramount. Uh, the go-between between, between uh, your production and the studio that knew the studio business and how to right, get you yeah. what you wanted, right? Yeah, because when e every weird uh, suggestion came down from the studio, like they wanted to uh, put in the role that of striker Bob Hayes, they wanted to put Barry Manilow. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> can you imagine? And, and and we were just we were these young cubs, and oh, we're gonna quit, we're gonna walk. <laughs> and and Co Howard said, just calm down. This is this will you know this will go away and. Uh, some of the other executives who uh, kind of befriended us and took us under their wing would call up, and they also wanted, uh, you know, Bill Murray or Chevy Chase, and we didn't want comedians. And so they, uh, they would call their agent and said, uh, your client really doesn't want to do this. This is, you know, it's like they're first-time directors. There are three of them. This is going to be chaos. And so, and so we, we avoided all well, that. One of the fascinating things I learned, I didn't realize that Bruce Jenner auditioned for Airplane. Right. Isn't that he, wild? He came, somebody, somebody was pushing Bruce Jenner to be in the movie. I don't, I don't know who, but he came in three times to, to audition. And one time, he went over to Jerry's apartment to run lines. Really? And he kept, saying, uh, he kept saying to Jerry, is this what Mr. Koch wants? Like, Mr. Koch has anything to do with, you know... What the what the content was, but uh, uh, you know he he came in three times. I, the first two times to uh, to read for Stryker, and the third yeah. time to read for Elaine. So we, <laughs> uh, 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 we didn't realize at the time there Got there it. might be other stuff <laughs> happening. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, we should have known back then. Yeah, <laughs> there you we, go. we didn't know. Yeah. When, uh, what was the weekend like when you didn't know if they would let you direct the movie? And uh, basically, you got another offer from another studio. Yeah, we had another offer and we, uh, from Avco Embassy at the time. I don't know if they're still in existence, but they were going to let us direct. And uh, so we said, so we, we, we took a weekend to figure out where we're going to go. And we decided, yes, we're going to go with Avco Embassy. This is another stupid decision yeah. that we were saved. So, um, we told Jeff Katzenberg, who was then the vice president there, we said, well, we've decided to go with Avco. We're not going to stay at Paramount. And it, it took him about five minutes to convince us that we were not going to Avco and we're going to stay at Paramount. But I think that may have kind of lit a fire under someone, and they said, we better give in. So they did let us direct. So you had a, a, a two-week hanging sword over your heads to direct the movie. They could have fired you within the first two weeks. It, what was the first scene you filmed for Airplane? Well, very wisely, our producer, John Davison, 
uh, scheduled for the first day's dailies, first day's shooting, uh, surely you can't be serious. And then I am serious and don't call me Shirley. So that was right in the first days, and evidently they told us the, uh, the, the screening room, just everybody, it's erupted, they cracked up, and then Katzenberg called uh, minutes later saying, uh, don't worry about being fired. Isn't so, that great? Yeah. Thank God. Yeah. So interesting. Uh, you, th you think about the choices you make when you're scheduling a movie. You're basing it on location, budget, yeah. uh, actors, schedules, things like that, and to shoot that scene first and that ensures you don't get fired as a director. Is a yeah, but, brilliance. you know, I, I remain surprised that they were surprised at that because, you know, we knew it would work. And then yet when it, when it did, you know, Leslie Nielsen being funny and saying it completely straight, then they got it because evidently from the script, they didn't, they didn't really sure. get it 100%. I, I, I wonder if people, you know, when you see the words on the page, the jokes don't really don't translate, and you don't necessarily understand that what makes Airplane brilliant and what makes your style of comedy brilliant is playing, the actors don't realize they're in a comedy. Right, well, we, yeah, we right? said to the actors, don't play it straight. Play it like you don't know that you're in a comedy, and that's really the only way we can do it. And everybody understood it. Lloyd Bridges was a little slow to understand it. He was trying to make sense out of his dialogue. <laughs> and he just, you know, and, you know, in his defense, you know, actors want to find a character. And uh, he was trying to find a character, and we just wanted him to play Lloyd Bridges. Yeah. We, you know, we didn't know anything about character. What was the uh, most difficult day shooting Airplane? Um, oh, probably Kareem. <laughs> because, because he wouldn't fit in the cockpit, or no, it was because he's a non-actor, and there's a child actor, and so, uh, and and also, Peter Graves with the kid was, you know, we that had to be dialed in exactly. You know, it had to be. Have you ever seen a grown man naked? He, I mean, he couldn't look at the kid. I mean, it had to be done a certain <laughs> to way to make it more menacing. Is that why? There's a fine, that was a tightrope. That was a fine line we had to Yeah, tread. I mean, not yeah. making con eye contact is a stroke of brilliance, right? He's flying a plane, of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, but it wasn't perverse. It was we were making fun of the image of pilots. Sure. You know, so. yeah. <laughs> what, uh, uh, so the movie comes out and is a smash hit. What, what, at what point did you realize, holy shit, we've got a, a hit on our hands here? Well, actually, we realized it before opening night. We, we had a first screening just for the executives at Paramount, and that was a disaster, like every first screening of a comedy is. Why? Because you don't know what's funny, and you, you generally uh, edit together about 110 minutes, and uh, the movie actually has to be cut down to 85 minutes, so, but you just don't know what is funny. So we always take it out to get previewed, and we, in those days, we would take it to colleges. And so, and, and then we trimmed the movie to, to the laps. Wow. But we didn't know, but, so we didn't know in that screening, and we just had to kind of endure that. And then we got to work in the cutting room, and then we, we screened it at the University of California, Davis, which is, I guess, near Sacramento. And that was, that worked great. So I think we knew, we knew we had it. Right then. Really? Uh, yeah. When that first test screening, does anyone else wish they could have been there for that, <laughs> right? Wouldn't that be wild? Uh, how did you feel afterward? Did it get the laughs you expected in the room? Was well, it for, you mean the first, the first, first one? Like, what well, was there the was, oh, it was terrible. We thought, oh my God, we've been working 10 years since the theater, and this is going to be a flop. This, yeah. is, this didn't work. But there was one guy in the audience who laughed all the way through, <laughs> and we cut the movie to him. Really? To one, yeah, to one guy, and uh, and and so, but it, and so it it ended up working. And also, Katzenberg was great in uh, you know talking us off the ledge. Yeah, because you know, we tended to be very, you know, uh, on the edge. <laughs> yeah. When you uh, make airplane it comes out, it's a smash hit. Uh, I did the inflation calculator, by the way. Uh, it made four hundred fifty million dollars in today's dollars. And yeah, the budget and was and three and, and the million. budget was three point uh, two million. So crazy, and and the studio couldn't hide the money fast enough. <laughs> so 
So we did see a little bit of profit. Yes. I mean, that is a there, massive because we had the hit. worst deal in in ever because you know they just. Yeah. When did you realize the legacy of what you had created? Uh, uh, how did years go by? You know, we, we we think about that a lot with Impractical Jokers. Or oh, you guys have no legacy, but we airplane have none. <laughs> none. is we, we really none. have a. I legacy. have no pride either yeah. at this point. Right? Yeah, but. Um, you know, uh, we do get asked, you know, did you, uh, were you surprised when it became a hit? And the truthful answer is no, we were not surprised because we had been telling people for five years, finance this movie, it's going to be a big hit. So when it was, uh, we thought, okay, it's, it's, this is what it should have been. However, uh, we, we were surprised at the fact that it's lasted this long. Yeah. And it, it's, we still show it in front of uh, live audiences, and it still gets the same laughs. Same thing with Top Secret. Top uh, Secret right, has become yeah. a classic right, over yeah, the years, yeah. right? And that gets the same laughs. I, I love all your movies. Top Secret is my favorite, favorite one. And in Zucker's office, where the first time you invite us to your home, right, we go in, and in his office, he's got the, uh, the anal... Intruder, the, 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 the giant yeah. Right, yeah. fist the that vibrates. Yeah, it's yeah, it's got, two yeah. feet wide. It's right. mounted, mounted on and the wall. The, the, and we have the big phone in yeah. there. Yeah. Which yeah. I've got the same thing in my house, but it's, it's not from a movie. <laughs> yeah. Well, you've never invited me to your yeah. house. <laughs> you, want, you want to come over tonight? Sure. Uh, no. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I can't. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it, it's amazing the legacy uh, uh, over the years from Airplane and, of course, from... Uh, you have to mention Naked Gun. Uh, the, uh, those were my favorite. And one of the things, I, I, I'm in the audio book uh, for this, and I'm in the yes. physical book as well. Uh, and the guys and I, uh, I've told the story many times, but uh, uh, your movies were so impactful on the guys and I from Jokers, and for me personally, because uh, you know my father passed away a few months ago from Alzheimer's, a disease he had struggled with for many years. And as a family, we struggled with for many years. And um, you know, in the past two years, he had... Uh, didn't recognize me anymore, certainly, certainly didn't recognize my mother before she passed. And um, to the day he died, he could still quote Airplane. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy, That's right? right? Yeah. Yeah. He thought I was Shirley. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Shirley, yeah. That's good. Like I, mean, I think that that's a testament to what you created, uh, bringing generations. Uh, it was the movie my father and I bonded over. Uh, yeah, well, it does. You know, our, our movies are, do not, uh, you know, divide generations. I mean, yeah. I think everybody can. We used to say, uh, like about some of the Naked Guns, actually, you know, a movie the whole family can see, just not together. <laughs> uh, yeah. Because the, uh, some of the things are a little rude. But I think, you know, we're not making fun of, like, the older generation, and we're not, you know, it's just like, it, it, it does go o around yeah. that. Uh, I, I do want to take time for some Q&A. Uh, before we do, one question I've always meant to ask you, and I thought this would be kind of interesting, is out of all the eras of your life, from your early days making that student film uh, in, in college to opening the Kentucky Fried Theater in Wisconsin, then to L.A., then to the making of Airplane, then Naked Gun, so on and so forth, Top Secret. If there were any era you could go back to in your life to relive uh, for the first time again, what would it be and why? Well, it, 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 during my lifetime, because yeah. I've always wanted to go back to, <laughs> to <Jesus> 1941 <laughs> no, uh, and uh, yeah, see if I could be around when my parents met. But uh, I think that uh, I, I would go back to, uh, I, I would love to do Top Secret over again. Really? <laughs> yeah. And put in a character for Val. <laughs> that's the, yeah. But, uh, nah, you know, the... There's always stuff that you'd want to uh, do over again, uh, but but I, I for me, it, it's always I'm always looking forward to the next thing, and I have a uh, a, a new script that I'm going to do in the uh, in the spring. How cool is that? Called, Zucker's uh, with a new movie. Uh, they start yeah. shooting, and, and uh, uh, it's a uh, film noir. And finally, I'm going to get a chance to do it a black and white movie. Yeah, can we <laughs> <laughs> can we announce it now? He cast me as a lead. How cool! Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's uh, uh, no, it the wasn't lead. the lead. It was of the. The janitor, I yeah. think. Yeah. <laughs> the janitor. Yeah. No, janitor number three. No, I think, the yeah. Not the janitor in the movie. The janitor on set. I'll be cleaning up right, after. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, I would say uh, some of your movies got us through COVID. We brought our kids here tonight. Um, Naked Gun is definitely our favorite. What was, uh, what was it like working with Leslie Nielsen on multiple movies? Naked Gun, Airplane, Scary Movie. Uh, Leslie was great. He was uh, uh, you know, a funny guy, although, I mean, 
all of the, all of the funny lines were written by Pat Proft, but uh, Leslie on the set would, uh, I mean, he was an anarchist, and he would bring this little uh, diaphragm which made fart sounds. <laughs> and while the other actor was trying to be serious and read the lines, Leslie would go you know, like that, and, and he would do that on talk shows. Uh, we, did a, we did a press tour together, and we were in Charlotte, North Carolina, and on an, a crowded elevator, and people recognized him, and so Mr. Nielsen, and he would do the fart machine. <laughs> And, and people couldn't get off that elevator fast enough. Uh, but no, he was a great guy. And, and so I think I put the, the, the eulogy uh, that I, I read at his, his wake is, is in the book. Oh, hi. I just have a question. Um, growing up, Mr. Zucker. Um, you can call me David. David. <laughs> growing up, David. We're, I thought you, you were going to say you could call me Mr. Zucker. <laughs> <laughs> she just did. Yeah. Um, were you inspired by anyone in your family? Was your family, um, you know, was there always jokes going on? Like, where did you kind actually, of inspire your humor? Actually, we were inspired by my dad. And uh, he would, he would, he didn't know how to tell a joke, but he would say very funny things with a straight face and then, and then let people laugh. I mean, he would, kid around with his, <laughs> he had a real estate firm and he had, you know, an assistant and, and some other employees and he would always tease them and just, but say everything in very straight face. And so we, I think we were inspired by that. Also, at the dinner table at our house growing up, uh, it was a pun fest. We would just do, be doing puns all, all dinner time. Very good. Uh, David, I just want to thank you for all the uh, You humor. should call me Mr. Zucker. Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Don't disrespect David yeah. Zucker. So, Mr. David Zucker. Yes. <laughs> um, but once again, I wanted to thank you. Your Airplane was the first movie I ever paid to go see twice, ever. Uh, paper route money, as a matter of fact. Which movie was that? Airplane. Oh, Airplane. Yeah. Okay, yes. We should have talked about that. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Uh, my paper route? <laughs> no, okay. Anyway. Um, I remember watching cable one day, and a movie popped on called Kentucky Fried Movie. <laughs> And I had never seen anything like this in my life. <laughs> and I, you guys didn't talk about that at all. I'm curious how that evolved. And uh, Well, we, it, it evolved because we wrote the first draft of Airplane, and we couldn't get it financed. So John Landis came to see our show and said, why don't you do a movie of your show? And so that's, you know, we wrote a script based on sketches from our theater show and a lot of new material. And that's how we did it. And we didn't know how to direct, so John Landis uh, directed it. One more follow-up. I mean, obviously, you couldn't make a movie like that today. But, well, do you have any statement about, like, you know, if that's a good thing, a bad thing, or anything like that? Uh, well, you could, you know, I mean, if, if you made a movie like that, I mean, it would have to be R-rated. But I, I do get asked a lot, you know, could you make Airplane today? And my answer is always, of course, just without the jokes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so that's what, you know, that's what, it, you know, there's a lot of sensitivity today, not among the audience, but in, in the studio boardrooms. The studio executives is, is a frightened class of people, and they probably would have said, you know, oh, uh, uh, the pilot uh, trying to come on to a little boy? No, we couldn't do that. Or, or uh, subtitling black people? You know, you can't do that. I mean, it's just too sensitive today. But uh, I, I'm still going to do... Uh, uh, I'm going to do my next movie, and I'm going to continue to be insensitive. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> what was the riskiest project you've worked on, either in the context of finance or content? Uh, well, I did a goodness video once, and uh, I cast uh, people who I knew, uh, celebrities that I knew, and, uh, and it was going to be shown on PBS, and uh, it's the importance of being good and honest, and I, and uh, I, of course, I cast O.J. Simpson. <laughs> <laughs> so only I could have done this, and so uh, unfortunately it was not shown. I think we showed it on PBS, but without, we cut out O.J. Well, <laughs> what was uh, your last interaction with O.J.? Oh. You know, I really don't want to talk about it that much, but, but oh, I I, 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 it was at the rap party of uh, Naked Gun 33 and a third. Uh, I just said goodbye to him. 
Uh, I, I shook his hand. I sold him my knife collection, and I never saw him. <laughs> I, I never saw him again after that. Yeah, uh, yeah. checks out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I just want to say thank you for this. And uh, the first uh, movie I ever bought was Airplane on VHS, and they were they weren't cheap then. But if you ever want to uh, remake the movie, I already have an air, uh, uh, airline pilot's uniform, and my hair is the right color. <laughs> <laughs> you need a blind pilot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we, I think we did have a joke with the three blind pilots. With, yeah. uh, Jose Feliciano and uh, who and uh, who's the uh, Ray Charles and, Ray and, Charles. and oh, yeah, Stevie yeah, Wonder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, then Stevie Wonder, right? Thank you. Oh, okay, that's that it. was okay, the question. Great, great. Okay. but but we did. Uh, but Paramount wanted to do a sequel to Airplane, and we didn't, because we didn't think we had enough jokes in, you know, for the second half of Airplane. So we, uh, but they were insistent, they wanted to do Airplane 2. So we came up with an idea, and the idea was, uh, you know, Bob Hayes and Julie Haggerty, you know, they fly down the plane, and he, they're gonna get married, he takes her home to meet the family, and it's the Godfather. And so, and we would do the whole, the whole thing, and it would be, you know, the marionette thing with the twisted plane. But, uh, and the, uh, the studio loved the idea, but then they had to run it by Francis Coppola, and he said no, because uh, he wanted to do uh, uh, Godfather 3. So, wow. I mean, what we say in the book is that, you know, everybody would have been better off had we done <laughs> that, that airplane 2. <laughs> oh. uh, <laughs> it's okay. Oh. We'll go to you next. It's okay. Um, going back to what you said about if you made something like this day, it would have to be R-rated. Now, going back to you know the airplane and the naked guns, surprising thing is they are all PG or PG-13, and you still slipped in some like amazing stuff in there, like the nice beaver line. <laughs> Were there any times that you actually did butt heads with the MPAA over any kind of gags? Uh, yeah, there was there was always there there are some movies that we did. Um, there was a couple of movies. Uh, there was a movie called uh, that I did called High School High, and that was that was a big fight with the MPAA over that. But and, and that was PG thirteen. And then I did basketball with Matt Stone and Trey Parker, and we just decided we'll just do it R rated. So, um, but I, I I kind of if I had that to do over again, there's an answer to your question. I could do basketball over with a PG thirteen. Mm. I meant to relive. Oh, From a mean? joy point of view, where would you? What era of your life? Oh, would what you era? Live? Uh, probably, uh, uh, probably uh, when I got married. Actually, wow, yeah, that's oh, right. Nice. Yeah, and the and the uh, it was a wonderful moment, and probably and the a low point was then when I got divorced. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so what, what can you do? Yeah. <laughs> what was it about the zero hour that made you think it would be so funny as a comedy movie? Oh, well, you know what we would do is we would watch these old movies and uh, really these uh, black and white thrillers, you know, just dead serious. They had, they had no sense. There was not a joke in the whole thing. And we used to redub them. And so if a character would say, uh, it's a war movie or something, uh, what time does the plane leave? And the other characters, oh, uh, at exactly, oh, 800 hours. And we would dub in, where is your hand? It's right here at the end of my wrist. So... <laughs> You know, and we would do, and so th this uh, Zero Hour seemed like the perfect movie to redub, uh, but then it was just a short leap to saying, let's just recast it and remake it. So that, that was the, the big idea that we had. There you go. Uh, is there a scene from Airplane that ended up on the cutting room floor that you wish had ended up in the movie that all of us got to see? Uh, no, usually... Uh, they end up on the cutting room floor because we preview it and it doesn't get a laugh. I mean, there was a, we had uh, in, the, in the airport, uh, walking through the airport is this gorgeous model woman and, uh, and she just goes <laughs> and just spits against the wall. <laughs> and we thought it was hysterical. I think, uh, unfortunately, they don't save any of the, uh, the, 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 the old dailies. So, I, I'd like to see that again and see what we did wrong, but it must have been something that we, that we didn't do right. But uh, it, it's, but your question brings up, you know, when they, 
on comedies when they say, and there's deleted scenes, an extra thing. You know, deleted scenes in comedies are deleted because they aren't funny. So <laughs> why would anybody want to sit through unfunny scenes? I don't know. Hello? Have you ever seen the inside of a Turkish prison? <laughs> <laughs> You've been waiting years to ask that yeah. question. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, the year before, uh, Midnight Express had just been released, and yeah. that was, and we were impressed with the Turkish prisons. <laughs> was that your only question? I love it. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> your one opportunity to speak yeah. to David Zucker, and that's your yeah, question. No, if I was in a Turkish prison. <laughs> I, I appreciate the question, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, thinking about Police Squad, and um, what, what was the difference? What was it like? Uh, directing a, a TV show versus a movie, uh, and why did it only last six episodes? Was it supposed to last more? Well, it was, uh, you know, we, we really wanted to do Naked Gun, but we didn't know how to do a story and a plot at that point. So uh, Michael Eisner said, I can, I can get ABC to put six episodes of this uh, half hours on the air. So we said yes, and, uh, and we wrote and directed the pilot um, but for, with TV, it's just, you know, you, you don't have the time, you know, having, you have to write it in a week and then shoot it in a week. There's not enough time uh, that you have in a feature to, we, I mean, we wrote Airplane for years, just, you know, rewriting and rewriting. And then, and then we had the time to direct it. And then the, the TV show. Uh, you know, th these things really don't work on TV because it, it's uh, our material supposed to be uh, seen by a theatrical audience in a so you can hear the laughs. Otherwise, it needs a laugh track. And Tony Thomopoulos, the head of ABC, kind of uh, uh, asked us if we would put a laugh track on it. And you know, we felt bad for him because it was you know the thing was not getting very good ratings. But we said, well, we couldn't because it's not supposed to be funny. And so there was a big press conference where a bunch of reporters were asking him, why did you, and they obviously liked Police Squad, and, and, and they were really grilling him. And, and Tony Thomopoulos said, Police Squad didn't work because you had to watch it. And, and, and that was, I guess that's true, yeah. So people, a lot of TV people don't, uh, it doesn't, it's not so much sight gags, it's, uh, uh, the Jokers can do it, and, and uh, Seinfeld does it, and Larry David. I mean, there's certain shows that are great and made for TV. I don't like most sitcoms. I just I don't find them funny at all. So, but and and even most movies, I don't really find that funny. But um, but I, I want to, you know, I remember there was a movie called Bad Grandpa, and I thought that was I was really laughing at that. Yeah. yeah. I just remember <laughs> the movies. That I like, and and Bill Hader was in uh, Trainwreck. I thought that was funny, yep. and yeah. Anyways, uh, Mr. Zucker, uh, uh, I mean David. Uh, well, is it okay if I just call you Shirley? Is that okay? Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Or or, or or Turkish prison. I don't know. So um, uh, I thought it was really interesting hearing about your start with short films, comedic in um, school, and I was wondering if you had any you know specific advice to give to someone else in that position who wants to start in making films and comedy and things like that at oh, a young oh age. Oh, yeah. Uh, quit now. You'll never make it. <laughs> That's, and, and okay. I, I, <laughs> but uh, but I, I don't mean to be too flip about it, but uh, you know, if you can disregard that advice, you'll be halfway there. And, and that is to say that I don't really want to be responsible for uh, saying to anyone, hey, you can do it. You know, go it. You know, because it, it, is, it is tough. And uh, and I think we we sh we we show in the book how it was tough, but we uh, and a lot of it took a lot of perseverance, you know, and we just kept at it, and we always believed in ourselves. And the other thing we had was we had the three of us. We had we really had each other, and that was uh, that was a big part of it. So, uh, but I thought we it was a partially real self confidence and naivete that that got us, you know, that, thought, that made us think that we could do this. We could go to L.A. and do movies, and we just thought there was no reason why we couldn't, yeah. Which is what I, one of the main reasons I love you dearly as a friend uh, and respect most about you is that, uh, and you really get a sense of this in the book when you're reading it, that 
Zucker just wouldn't take no for an answer. He never once believed. Out of the three of you, that's right. most definitely your personality. And knowing you now for years as a friend, <laughs> just never thought to himself, well, why can't we do this? You know, it never occurred to him that he couldn't succeed doing the, what he loved. Yeah, I mean, we would, we would watch movies, and we liked Mel Brooks, you know, Blazing Saddles. We liked Woody Allen, Bananas and stuff. But we thought we could do that. We, you know, we could do as well as that. So we just we kept, kept at it. And thank God <laughs> they did, right? Uh, I think we have to wrap up now. But uh, uh, my friend, uh, one of the greatest uh, people ask us a lot, like, what is... Uh, what, what, what's your best experience from Impractical Jokers? What do you love most? What's the, you know? And one of the, uh, the greatest uh, moments in my life is meeting you and becoming friends with you. And uh, I, I never in my life imagined we would become friends or that you would like our work. It blew us away. Uh, I, uh, the book is amazing. You're going to love it when you read it. Uh, when you go out for uh, autographs with David, he can also give financial advice, whatever you yeah, want right. to <laughs> know. And Just, thank you. And you know, for what you guys have done for me is, you know, I don't like anything, and so and people would think, well, he's just old and doesn't have a sense of humor, but I said, okay, I like the Jokers, so that, that kind of gets me uh, through but, that. But uh, the, the legacy of your book and your career uh, extends long past all of our lives. Uh, how about a hand for creating such an amazing uh, Thank you very much. Yeah. Love you, my friend. Thank, thank you. you. Love you, too. Yeah, thank you.